Lucy Worsley, OBE, is by day Joint Chief Curator at Historic Royal Palaces, the independent charity that looks after many historic palaces and buildings in and around London. By night, she's a writer and presenter, and also the author of many historical titles, both fiction and non-fiction. She also appears regularly on radio and television, such as The One Show, Time Watch and other history programmes. Her children's books include My Name is Victoria, Eliza Rose and her latest title, Lady Mary, which is a story of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon's divorce, as you've never heard it before, from the eyes of their daughter, Princess Mary. Nikki Gamble met with Lucy to discuss this latest title and to find out more about her writing life. I'd like to start really with Mary and I'm really interested to know why you thought that she was an interesting subject. I know when I read the book I suddenly became aware um, how little I knew about her even though as a child I was somebody that read a lot of historical fiction. Back in the day it was the Jean Pladies uh, that I was reading and Elizabeth is centre stage, but Mary gets less attention. So why did you feel that she was a subject that we'd like to know about? Of course, a book like this is is entertainment. I hope that people will enjoy it and have a good time when they're reading it. But I actually have quite a serious um, message beneath it. And the reason that Mary hasn't taken centre stage in popular culture is because of anti-Catholic propaganda. Centuries worth of anti-Catholic propaganda. Because most people think of her as bloody Mary who burnt people so I thought I would try to set myself the challenge of perhaps chipping away at that because she's only bloody Mary and a baddie if you believe that it's really important whether we're Catholic or Protestant and they are are equally worthy of respect so I felt that there was a an image makeover that she sort of deserved to have So I tried to show her as someone who was very tenacious, someone who would be a powerful female person in the Tudor age, which she indisputably was, whether you think that she's bloody or not. And exactly how much do we know about her? Is there much out there? What sort of sources were you able to use to construct your portrait um, of her? Well, the history of the 16th century fascinates me because we think that we know so much about it. These these are like characters in a soap opera, aren't they? Henry VIII, his wives, Catherine of Aragon, Mary's mother. But really, the evidence is so fragmentary. I, I have worked as a historian in other later periods, and you do feel you can get much more of an insight into somebody's mind if, you know, you're reading somebody's personal diary who's written in the 18th century when literacy is widespread and there's a sort of interiority to, to literature. In the 16th century, we're working from tiny clues. So those clues take on great significance to us, but it is possible to build up a picture from them. And I have tried to weave into my story things that I know that really happened, like when Mary was refusing to accept her father as the head of the Church of England when she was staying loyal to the the Catholic Church. The Duke of Norfolk was sent to sort of out, and he said, if this was my daughter, I would beat her head against the wall so that her brains were as soft as baked apples. Horrible. Uh, Horrible, but wonderful. wonderful. (laughs) And I was thinking, what what kind of a girl would merit that treatment? Somebody with incredible strength and character and purpose, seeing as she was just a girl and he was a duke. So tiny details build a picture and then we create a story, a narrative and whenever you write a narrative there's always a smoothing out of fact if you like and I'm really interested from a reader's point of view and a teacher's point of view about that wonderful area between fact, truth, fiction And fact and truth are not quite the same thing either. So where does the imagination take off um, and where is the fact in the the book? I really like the way you've put your question. (laughs) Most people come at this issue, they say, is it accurate? How accurate is it? Is it true? You know, binary distinction. And even non-fiction, it's very hard to say it's true because, you know, we, we weren't. We weren't there. And what excites me about writing fiction as opposed to non-fiction is the idea of expressing truth as opposed to knowledge, Mm -hmm. if you like. And often if you hear a historical novelist talking, they'll say, my research is really important to me. I want to get it as accurate as I can. I put in all these details that I've discovered chiselling away at my sources. But 
the way I've approached it, because I am a historian, that's my training, that's my background, I've sort of tried to let all that go and I haven't really too bothered about it too much. You know? <laughs> I, I, I feel like I know this period, I know these characters. What I've worked on is trying to create a story with a narrative and a journey and self-discovery and all of these things that, that novelists excel at. Um, so the bones of it are true but it's a category error to say that it must be true or false like Mm. you like you implied um this i think that the skill of being a historical novelist and i only aspire in this area (laughs) is to create a magical fusion i suppose what people really ask when they say is it accurate is can i trust you can i trust you to tell do you know to have got the basics right are you a reliable narrator Mm. And that's what I aspire to being, a, a, a trusted narrator, so they can just stop worrying about that mm-hmm. and get into the story. I don't know if you've ever heard of a children's writer called Jill Payton Walsh. Mm. She wrote a wonderful book called A Parcel of Patterns, which was about uh, the Ian plague. Yes. And when she was asked a similar question, she said that the writer of historical fiction should never knowingly write something that wasn't true... Mm but they were free to write whatever they liked from the thrilling quagmire of what might have been. And I just think that's a lovely uh, way uh, of putting it. But I guess even if we'd uh, read a non-fiction book by you, it would still be your view of Mary. So, you know, the the same issues apply to non-fiction as they do to fiction. It's always somebody, there's always subjectivity in there to some degree, isn't there? Yes, yes, I suppose so. And I, I'm not sure that I... So, um... Jill Patton Walsh might read a book that I've written called My Name is Victoria and say, what a load of cobblers, because it has quite... I have played with the truth in that one. It has quite an unexpected ending, which I don't want to reveal because that will spoil the surprise if anybody ever reads it. But the way the story finishes is not true. It did not happen like that, but it could have done. So I'm sort of playing with a counterfactual Mm -hmm. narrative in that case. And I did... I was arguing about this recently with... Uh, a children's author that you're going to remember the name of. He's got a huge beard. Is he called Philip Arda? Yes. Philip Arda. So Philip, Philip and Arda had a bit of a ding-dong on this. He said, no, it's impossible to write historical fiction about somebody who we know, like Queen Victoria or Princess Mary, because we can't know enough to get it right. So what he does is he imagines characters but gets the environment accurate. I have sort of been making the case for doing it the other way around, I think, to, <laughs> to take the protagonist and then not worry too much about the environment. Obviously, and, and you've made such a strong case for this, that what you're doing primarily is telling a story. But nevertheless, you do want to create and convey a sense of the period and the time. What I loved as a reader of this book was that I was never aware of you trying to do that I was just (laughs) completely absorbed in the story it was it was great Uh, but every now and then I was brought up in a good way confronted with uh, some of the wonderful language I'll tell you in particular two phrases that uh, delighted me Uh, one was when the ambassadors were leaving Mary's company Mm. and you wrote no more sound than syllabub overflowing its bowl (laughs) and of course that is information because syllabub was a dessert of that particular period but you wove it in so beautifully into the figurative language Uh, and I think only as an adult perhaps um, was I noticing it in that particular way Uh, there was another bit as well where Mary was you know shocked by something that had happened and you talked about a trout brought out of the moat and onto the grass with her her mouth kind of popping open. And again, immediately, that is historical information that's there within that figurative language. Is this something that um, you're aware of as you're writing, how to get in little bits of exposition without giving us a history lecture? I I know why I've written both of those two (laughs) things, and I haven't put a great deal of thought into it. It's through working at Hampton Court. Those are things that, you know, we talk about every day. Uh, I probably spend too much time in the Tudor kitchens with the Tudor cooks making their syllabubs. And we have a moat and my colleague Larry's office looks out over the moat and sometimes we think about, you know, how we could catch fish out of the window. So uh, you're probably giving me credit for too much creativity. Do you think so? Yeah, that's just stuff that happens at the office. <laughs> 
I'd like to ask a question about history and the curriculum. Obviously, working at the historic palaces, you have an educative uh, role there. What are the arguments to be made for retaining history in the school curriculum? Oh, goodness. Now, I, I often I get this, asked this question from, from time to time. Whenever there's one of these furores in the press, as there often are, about the history curriculum, you know, isn't it shocking that the Anglo-Saxons get so much prominence, blah, blah, blah. And they just come round and round and round these arguments. And they matter because what is on the curriculum is actually the stuff of what the British nation is. We are no more than a whole collection of stories about the past, aren't we? So they are going to be very hotly disputed. Um, what I always say, and this is a bit of a cop out, <laughs> is that I don't want to get in, I won't, don't want to become political fodder. I always defer to the Historical Association, which is the professional body for history teachers. And those are the ones who know the nuts and the bolts of the curriculum and what's working and what's not working. So I would always follow the official line of the Historical Association about what the detail of the curriculum. But should history be on the curriculum? Yes, of course it should, for so many reasons. And uh, top of my list is enjoyment and the pleasure of it. But that's the thin end of the wedge, you see. I'm, I'm all about trying to entice people over the threshold so that they will go on and they will learn the skills of a historian. I mean, the content of history doesn't matter so much as the ways in which historians have to exercise their minds um, using skills like analysis and uh, judgment and debate and the ability to work out when somebody's lying to you and that's so important in a world of alternative facts and fake news isn't it mm-hmm. so in 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 a way that lawyers or journalists can question power so must historians be able to do that too that's why it's important i think we'll start with fun but we'll move on to something that's very serious indeed i'm getting quite passionate now mm-hmm. I fully appreciate uh, not wanting to get into the political argument of that. And in a way, you took me on to my next question, which was not so much the what of history, but the how. And you've talked about the skills. Um, And there are other questions to be asked about the how as well. I think in terms of whether for children it's best to have a chronological perspective or a topical perspective whether to start local or to think British, whether to think process or whether to think content. So there are actually quite a lot of issues that are not just about do we include the Vikings, do we include the Stone Age. From your own experience of learning and studying history, what do you think are the productive ways of learning to become a historian? Well, I, I'm personally hugely interested in, in character and the work that I do as a museum curator is a type of history that has a name in America, it's called public history. Uh, it's not really a thing in this country, but in America I would be a public historian, one whose, whose constituency is members of the public, whether that's kids or interested adults or, or whoever, or viewers of television programmes. So the sort of history that I have to work on, and I'm not doing my job properly if I don't, is the sort of history that has some contemporary resonance, relevance. So, for example, I'm just working on a programme about the suffragettes, And of course, you know, on one level, it's about the suffragettes and how great they are. But on another level, it is why have things not improved 100 years on for women in society? Mm -hmm. I chose to write about Mary, Lady Mary, because she's an attractive character. But my subtext is you're looking at this wrong because of centuries of propaganda that have been Mm -hmm. sort of built up against her. Now, how does that relate to kids in, in schools? I'm not sure, really, because I would be the last to say that you have to in your education concentrate on what appears on the surface to be the most relevant because of the wonderful joy of discovering weird things you know things that are completely alien and strange and everybody uses the example of Steve Jobs uh, studying calligraphy and developing Apple if you if you like Apple computers Um, I wouldn't ever want to sort of dampen down on that by saying everything must be connected to what you're reading in the papers today but that's what I'm always doing as I'm reading the papers myself I'm looking for a historical avenue and trying to think what historians can bring to the party because they can bring perspective they can bring a sense that things haven't always been the way they are and that makes you think they don't always have to be the way they are. It's, it sort of gives you hope, I think. I think it's interesting listening to you talk about relevance. And I think 
it's about not conceiving what relevance means in too narrow a way mm. and that actually mm. the role of the teacher might be to look at whatever history is being taught and to find ways of connecting that. I mean, most things will be relevant in one way or another. It's not just what's happened to you or in your local area. But I think that's the skill of a teacher, to look at how we can make these things relevant to your lives. And I think you can only do that by really knowing your students, because it will be different for every class, every student in that class. But that's, in a way, what a teacher does. Yes, I I agree with you. That's very, very good. The the really good ones are able to make that connection, aren't they? To see the light bulbs going Mm. on. And I I sometimes give a talk about Jane Austen, uh, who I admire greatly. What a woman! I don't think she's just an important writer. I think she's an important human being. And I measure the the success of my talk by, at the end, when she dies, sometimes I see the subtle movement of tissues in the audience. They've got their tissues out. They've been moved by this woman's story. My job is done. Do we have another children's book to look forward to in the not too distant future yes i'm in the throes of it now it features uh, my heroine jane austen and i have made her into a detective my goodness me <laughs> well a writer and a detective mm-hmm. there's not so not so much difference there in a way a writer is detecting mm-hmm. so i can see a synergy between those two roles and, and, she, and she had two young nieces in real life whom she advised on their love lives so these girls are a boon to me they're just what i like um people entering sort of puberty going up through their teens facing difficult life situations well lucy thank you so much for coming and talking to us today in the reading corner it's been a delight and uh A real pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you ever so much for having me.